Thank you for the invitation today to present um, my paper, High Frequency Trading Strategies. Um, my name's Amy Kwan. I'm from the University of Sydney, and it's co-authored with Michael Goldstein from Babson College and Richard Phillip, who's also from the University of Sydney. So this paper basically came out as a result of the ongoing debate amongst regulators, market participants, and academics about whether high frequency trading is good for our financial market, okay, which we heard from Sean um, as well as from the presentation last night or the discussion last night. So what are the current views out there? There's some people who definitely think that HFT is bad. Okay? For example, Michael Lewis, the author of the book Flash Boys, that claims that the US stock market was now a class system, rooted in speed of haves and have-nots. The haves paid for nanoseconds, the have-nots had no idea that nanoseconds had value. The haves enjoyed a perfect view of the market, the have-nots never saw the market at all. And likewise, Brad Katsuyama, who was the uh, focus of this book, um, claims that HFTs can pick up trading signals so they can race ahead and pick off trades from regular investors. Um, um, on the other hand, the early academic evidence is almost always supportive of HFT. Okay? Algorithmic trading, which, is a, which encompasses HFT, um, enhances liquidity and the informativeness of quotes. Okay? Improves liquidity, informational efficiency, improves traditional market quality measures, okay? decreases spreads, increases depth, and lowers short-term volatility. More recently, the evidence isn't as supportive. Okay? Hershey finds that HFTs can anticipate order flow from other investors. Hoffman claims that um, speed enables fast traders to extract rents from other market participants. Likewise, these two studies, um, which are quite recent, uh, Van Kervel and Menkveld and Karadzic and Murphy, find that HFTs initially trade against the wind, but then trade with the wind as a large trade progresses. Okay, so what do we mean by this? Well, if we think of a large pension fund wishing to buy Apple stock, what do the HFTs do? Well, once they detect that this trade is taking place, they are going to compete with the institution to trade in the same direction. Why might they want to do this? Well, if I know that someone is going to trade a large parcel of stock, I know that the future price is going to be higher. Okay? It's going to create a big buying pressure, which is going to push up the future price. I want to get in before the price goes up. So much is known about the effects of HFT, but the literature is unclear on how HFTs actually trade to influence financial markets. In other words, what are the information channels that drive HFT behavior? Almost all of the existing evidence is based on executed trades. We don't understand the order submission behavior and the strategies of HFTs. Why? Because the data hasn't been previously available. So what we do is we look at HFT trading strategies directly by looking at the full order book. So the data that we have is similar to the data that SEBI has released for Indian researchers. It's a full limit order book data, so we have information on the order submissions, when they're amended, when they're cancelled, or if they're eventually traded against. Two related studies to ours. Uh, the first is Malinova and Park. They uh, study HFT order submission behaviour in Canada, which is a multi-market setting. Uh, we look at Australia, which is a more consolidated market. And, and Subramanian and Zeng, they look at HFT limit order placements in NASDAQ. All right, so jumping to the main findings, in case I don't have enough time, First, we find that all traders trade with the order book in balance, but the HFTs do it better. Okay, so what do we mean by this? In the order book, if we observe that there's a lot of people wishing to buy versus the people wishing to sell, we can guess that the price is going to go up in the future. Okay, the buyer buying pressure is going to force the price up. What everyone tries to do is they try to trade on this information. They try to buy before the future predicted um, price increase. But HFT simply do it better than everyone else, especially at times when the market is highly volatile. We also find that HFT supply liquidity to the thick side of the order book where it's not needed, but, don't, but demand liquidity from the thin side where liquidity is most needed. So, 
Previous academic work has found that overall depth improves. This seems like a good thing for market quality. But what we look at is one-sided depth. Now, if I'm an institution wishing to buy shares, I don't care how much depth is on the same side of the book as me. I care about how much liquidity is available on the opposite side. So what we find is that HF2 don't provide liquidity there. They're always competing with me to trade in the same direction. How do they do this? They're simply better monitors of the limit order book. Okay? They're able to cancel their orders that are at high risk of being picked off. In other words, if the price is expected to decrease, then I'm going to cancel my orders on that side. I'm not going to be buying okay? because I'm expecting the price to decrease in the future. We also look at an event. Um, each, this was a faster data feed. It was an opt-in system. Okay? So on the ASX, you can pay an additional fee to get access to this faster data feed so you get information before the rest of the market. Um, after the implementation of each, we find that HFT are even better in their strategic trading. Right? The cost of this is that they're always competing with non-HFT, and as a result, they're crowding them out from the limit order book. Right? So non-HFTs, they can never get to the front of the queue in order to get a successful execution. All right. So as I said before, we're using full order book data. We look at the top um, 100 stocks on the ASX. Um, the data, uh, details on the order entry, order size, price, and we also have this identifier for the submitting broker, okay, which we can then classify into a proprietary HFT firm, an institutional um, broker, or a retail broker. And this data also contains a unique identifier so that we can track the lifetime of this order, okay, from when it's submitted to when it's amended or cancelled, or alternatively, if it's traded against. Okay, our focus is on uh, in 2012 because this event itch was introduced then. All right, so very quickly the descriptive stats. I won't focus on the stock characteristics, but if we look at the traders, it gives a very clear picture that HFTs are simply better at monitoring the book. Okay? The, cancel, uh, the number of orders that they cancel is substantially higher as a proportion relative to your institutions and your retail brokers. Okay, likewise, median submission to cancel time, they're cancelling their orders a lot quicker relative to the other brokers. Okay, so they're better at monitoring the book. All right, so how would a strategic trader trade? Okay, so here are two states of the market. On the left-hand side, we have a lot of bids relative to the amount of asks. Okay, so a lot of people are wanting to buy this stock. Not many people are wanting to sell this stock. And what do we expect the price to do in the future? We expect the price to go up. So ideally, if I'm a strategic trader, what would I do? My best position is this corner here. Okay? I'm at the top of the queue. There's a lot of people waiting behind me to also buy, which is going to support the price. So I'm buying before the price is going up. However, it's very hard to be in that position. Why? Because of price time priority. If I submit an order now, I'm going to be at the back of the queue. At the back of the queue, I'm unlikely to make it to the front of the queue before the price has moved away from me. So if I don't have a resting limit order in the book, my alternative is to trade immediately. I submit a market order, I pay a little bit, I cross the spread, but I still get my execution before the predicted price rise. What I really don't want to uh, do is be in these two situations. Okay? In these two situations, the price pressure is going down. Okay? There's a lot of sales, people wishing to sell relative to the people wishing to buy, and so the price is predicted to go down in the future. I definitely don't want to buy before the price falls. So the main measure that we use in this paper tries to capture this information. So we have a measure of depth imbalance which basically sums up the people wishing to buy and um, subtracts the people wishing to sell. And we scale by the sum of, of the buyers and sellers so that we have a measure that's bounded between negative one and one. And how do we interpret this? A high measure, so if it's close to one, we have a lot of people wishing to buy. If it's negative one, then we have a lot more people wishing to sell. So what do we expect to find? We expect a positive relationship between this measure and future stock returns. 
the more buying pressure, the more positive the future stock return, the more selling pressure, the more negative the future returns. And what we expect a strategic trader to do is to buy when depth of imbalance is high and sell when it is low. And this, these two graphs basically shows that people are doing this as we expect. So every day, we look at all the trades and we calculate this depth imbalance for all trades. Okay? And then we rank them from the highest depth imbalance to the lowest depth imbalance and we form depth ups. Okay? So bottom 10%, 10 to 20% and so on. So this is on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we look at all the trades within the decile and then we calculate the future returns. Okay? This is a short-term return um, based on the price 10 trades into the future. And we see a very clear relationship. If we have a very positive depth imbalance, the future returns are very positive. If we have a very negative depth imbalance, the returns are very negative. Do people trade on this information? Yes, they do. So the blue dots, they re represent um, the percentage of buy, uh, buyer-initiated trades. So these are people aggressively buying. The bigger the depth imbalance, the more aggressive buying we have. The more, aggre uh, the more negative the depth imbalance, the more aggressive selling we say. Okay, so this is the overall market. Everyone in the market, what we do next is we break up our overall market volumes into our trader categories. Okay? Our HFTs, our institutions, and our retail traders. What do we find? we find that everyone tries to do this to some extent, but HFTs are just much better at doing this. And so if we look at the extremes, okay, decile 7, 8, 9, HFTs are buying a lot more relative to their overall trading volumes, and retails and institutions are suffering as a result. Okay, they are getting picked off the order book. Even though they want to be buying, HFTs are simply better at doing this at the extremes. Likewise, when depth imbalance is very negative, the retails are suffering, institutions are also suffering, the HFTs are becoming very aggressive sellers. So in panel D, it shows pretty much exactly the same thing, except we're combining both the buys and sells into one measure. And so how we do this, we look at a volume imbalance, so it's bounded between negative one and positive one. And this graph just shows that HFT, they're a lot, a lot more sensitive to the depth imbalance than the other trader categories. They're buying a lot more before the price goes up and selling a lot more when the price is predicted to come down. Um, I won't go through the econometrics of it. How do they do this? They're order placement strategies. So when the depth imbalance is in the extreme, Okay, so here we've scaled it so buys and sells can be treated in the same way. Uh, we've just multiplied by Q, which is either negative 1 or 1. So basically, the bigger, the better. So when there's a very positive depth imbalance, or very big depth imbalance, they are very aggressive. Okay, they're submitting their market orders to cross the spread to buy or sell before the predicted price fall or price rise. With the limit orders, these are a little bit harder to time. So what they do... They submit when the book is relatively balanced. Okay, the measure is 0 0.059 on average. And then they wait. If the depth imbalance improves, then they allow their order to execute against an incoming market order. On the other hand, if the depth imbalance worsens, so it's going against them, then they start to amend and cancel their, trade, their order. Okay, so they avoid being picked off by other traders. Institutions and retails, for the active trades, they seem to trade in the right direction, so when they submit a market order, but their limit order strategies are not so clear. Okay? It's not very clear what they're actually doing. All right, so again, um, I, I won't go through the, the results and volatility, but basically, the more volatile the markets are, so if prices are moving around a lot, HFTs are even more successful in these times, okay, presumably because they can use their speed advantage to pick off the stay or limit orders of the institutional and retail brokers. Final experiment um, is this introduction of itch. Okay, so this itch, as I said, it was an opt-in system. 
you pay a small fee, and you get access to information faster. That the ASX claims it's up to seven times faster than the existing connections. Okay, so this happened on April 2nd, 2012. So we look at pre-post period of two weeks either side with a one-week implementation period. Okay, our assumption here is that HFTs are going to subscribe. Okay, the ASX won't tell us who actually subscribes, uh, but we made this assumption that given that they're the most speed sensitive, they're the most likely to be the first in, okay, to pay this fee. What do we notice? Well, as we expect, after the implementation of each, they become even better at this strategic trading relative to the other broker categories. If you remember back to the graph, the slope becomes even steeper. Finally, what happens to the non-HFT orders? They are simply crowded out of the limit order book. So how we calculate this is based on a probability of fill. What is the chance of them receiving successful execution given that they've submitted an order to the top of the book? What we notice is that after each, their probability of fill comes down. Okay? They are less likely to get successful execution of their limit orders when HFT become faster. Uh, in a more recent result, which I don't have here, I've split the um, orders into favorable fields and unfavorable fields. Okay? It's favorable if I'm trading in the same direction of the order book, and it's unfavorable if the depth on the other side is bigger. Okay? And as we expect, it's the probability of a favorable field for non-HFT that decreases when HFT get faster. So in conclusion, um, HFT trade on information contained in the limit order book, and they do this very successfully. Okay, so our findings provide an explanation for a lot of the existing uh, results that are reported in the literature. Uh, we show that they're able to predict future order flow by looking at this depth imbalance. They improve price efficiency because they're trading faster on this information, um, and, but potentially they could be increasing stock volatility. Um, in contrast to the findings that overall market depth increases, we find that it's one-sided depth that increases. It's the depth on the side that we don't want it to. Oh, it doesn't matter to us. Right? They're going to be taking liquidity from the thin side of the book uh, where investors are demanding it the most. Finally, as HFT become more strategic with faster trading speeds, they have an effect that they're crowding out non-HFT limit orders from the book uh, by reducing their probability of the field. Okay? So they are simply not getting to the front of the queue. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amy. <clears throat>